So could we be facing the biggest crash in history? Well, I want to go over the history of some crashes, uh, also quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. And uh, well, let's get started. So um, the question is, could we have the biggest crash in history? Um, first thing is, I would I would suggest that we are in a bubble, and we've been in a bubble for quite a long time. Um, will the bubble burst? Well, let's go through some things and, and talk about sort of previous crashes and, and try to learn from history. So um, one of the things that uh, has always been in history are pumpers. That is a real thing. Um, there's always been people out there to pump things, and uh, as long as you incentivize pumpers, meaning that there's a financial benefit to pumpers, there will be pumpers. Now, in the 1920s, it was actually quite interesting. There was a great uh, real estate speculation boom, and essentially, you know, after World War I, uh, people are like, you know what? There's never going to be another war again. <laughs> and you guys know how that turned out. You know, obviously there's World War II. But, um, you know, the idea, though, is that people were investing in real estate. And it was interesting because, um, in fact, the pumpers were pumping up, of all places, Florida. And Miami was a hotbed of it. And, in fact, the um, the newspaper Miami at the time was the heaviest newspaper in the country because there were so many ads uh, for basically pumping. It was kind of like your Reddit boards of today. Um, also, too, people were investing through the mail. Uh, they had never even been to Miami, but, um, you know, they heard about these great things. They got a mail offer, and um, you could make a lot of money quick. I'm sure you guys have heard these things before. And um, there's a, another uh, thing that happened as well is that there was a train uh, that was direct from, like, New York to Miami. made it really, really easy uh, for people to get down there. And, you know, that was sort of like, hey, it's going to be the big thing. Everyone's going to be vacationing in, in Miami. And so this group of people called the Binder Boys essentially started. And um, what they would do is they would sell people... Uh, contracts uh, to buy property. And to get this contract, you'd have to put 10% down, basically. And what ended up happening then is that these contracts became really, really hot commodities. So they were contracts to buy property, but you didn't actually own the property. You just got a contract for that property. And then your first payment would be due within 30 days. And what happened is it got so hot that you could actually trade contracts on these things. And sometimes you might trade one contract uh, maybe eight times a day. And those binder boys, they were making bank uh, during this time. And um, they would use these contracts like of signatures of people and like show hotels and restaurants and stuff like that and build up credit and just be partying up the whole time. And uh, then there was a race course, a, a race horse uh, track built in Florida and everything. It was party time in the 20s. But I'm sure you guys know what happened after that. Um, you know, not every party lasts forever. And uh, obviously, then you had the crash and then the Great Depression. And so it was game over. Um, in order to sort of alleviate uh, uh, this sort of thing and not let it happen again, that's what we told ourselves. We said, okay, never again. We got to create a whole bunch of systems. We got to create a whole bunch of rules. Let's, let's not let that happen again. No more no more Great Depressions. And um, so they, they passed the Glass-Steagall Act. This is 1933. And the basic idea was that you would separate commercial banks from investment banking because you don't want, you know, when, when customers were putting their money into, say, savings bank, uh, you don't want that bank to just like be using all people's savings, right, uh, to do speculative assets like, say, uh, speculating in, in, in Miami coastline and trying to build, you know, casinos and stuff like that. Um, and the idea was that, you know, if we separate the two, um, things would be a lot better. Now, however, in 1999, this was a bipartisan thing. So it wasn't like just one party. It was bipartisan uh, decided, you know what? Forget that Glass-Steagall Act. We need to get the party going again. We need to get the money moving. In the 1930s, at the trough of the, of the Depression, when Glass-Steagall became law, it was believed that government was the answer. It was believed that stability and growth came from government overriding the functioning of free markets. We are here today to repeal Glass-Steagall because we have learned that government is not the answer. We have learned that freedom and competition are the answers. And uh, they repealed most of uh, most of that. And one of the reasons was is that um, Citibank and other banks uh, wanted to become big conglomerates. They wanted to be investment banks, commercial banks, and insurance companies all wrapped in the one. And um, Congress says, you know what? I like big banks. Um, not everyone was on board, though. There were a few that voted against it. But uh, by and large, though, um, people people did vote for it. You can see the voting record here. In fact, um, there was someone uh, named Representative Dingle, uh, and uh, he was like, you know, uh, if we pass this thing, and you can see pretty much everyone voted yes, uh, but he was saying if we do pass this thing, there's going to be a time when the Fed's going to have to bail out the banks because essentially they're going to be too big to fail. And under this legislation, the whole of the regulatory structure is so obfuscated and so confused that liability in one area is going to fall over into liability in the next. 
Taxpayers are going to be called upon to cure the failures that we're creating tonight. And it's going to cost a lot of money, and it's coming. Just be prepared for those events. And you're going to find that they are too big to fail. So the Fed is going to be in, and other federal agencies are going to be in to bail them out. Just expect that. And um, this is right after 1999. Remember, the laws had changed. And he came up to with the dot-com boys, we'll call them. And the, these are essentially people who are out pumping uh, your dot-com stocks. And the, the big famous one at the time was uh, Pets.com. And the idea was that we're all going to buy uh, pet food online and, and uh, everything through the Internet, which wasn't necessarily wrong. But this particular company, they, they got so uh, enamored with themselves, they were, spa, they were buying up Super Bowl ads and advertising everywhere. And there was a lot of companies out there like that. Anything.com was getting tons of money, toys.com, stuff like that. And, um, you know, obviously then what happens with every bubble <laughs> is that there's a lot of speculation, a lot of fervor. Everyone's, you know, going for the same kind of stuff, uh, future of fintechs, you know, future of online shopping, future of all of these things. And ultimately it crashed. Uh, there's just too much fervor, too much money in the system, and not every company uh, succeeds. In fact, most of them do fail, and it was game over. Um, we actually went for a long period um, before we got back to the pumping market again. Um, and uh, building up to the, I'm sure you know, the financial crisis in uh, 08, 09, um, you basically had um, the system in place to where we were giving out loans and incentivizing giving out mortgages uh, to people who couldn't necessarily afford it. Uh, this was the sub subprime mortgage crisis. And the idea was you'd give people uh, loans that were sort of low interest rate in the beginning, and then they would go up over time. And then also, too, we had a uh, housing bubble. The housing bubble crashed. Uh, people couldn't afford to pay for their homes. And the other thing is, too, it happened is that their homes actually fell below the value that they originally bought it for. And it was just a huge mess. Um, part of the uh, thing that would happen with this mess is that um, what are you going to do with these people when they have these uh, contracts they can't pay and the bank's like, oh, crap, what do we do? Um, what, we, we need some help. We're too big to fail. Well, of course, what comes and happens, right? First, you have game over, but we can't let the party end. We got to like keep the party going. And so um, what the banks actually did uh, was ask the government for help. And this was a big bailout. This was a controversial move. Um, but the idea was that we need to keep the party going. And so um, the uh, Fed introduced a policy called quantitative easing. And um, the basic gist of this thing, and let me show you guys this chart here, is that um, the Fed would buy these contracts uh, from uh, the banks. And so these contracts were bad, essentially. In order to pay for these things, you would actually just print money. And you can see this drawing here. It's easy to see if you, you visualize it, though. But the basic gist of this thing is that the bank uh, sells the contract uh, to the Fed. The Fed just prints money out of thin air, gives that money to the bank, and then the idea is that the bank will use that cash then to lend it to people and get it out in the system as soon as possible. The reason why they did this is because um, in order to stimulate the economy, right, a lot of times what the Fed would do, they would lower interest rates to encourage lending. Um, but interest rates are already low. And so like, you know what, let's just print up money so that, that we can pay off uh, the banks, you know, so they don't have any bad contracts anymore, essentially bad mortgages uh, and things of that nature. And then the banks can use that cash and uh, lend it to consumers, and then we're off to the races again. Um, when in doubt, print money. Um, there was so much money printing, in fact. Uh, you can see this chart here. And the way that you read this, this is the um, Fed balance sheet. Uh, around 2008, there was about $800 uh, million on the Fed balance sheet. Um, as of now, we're in 2022 as recording. Um, there's close to uh, $8.6 trillion. Uh, yes, that's trillion with a T on the Fed balance sheet. So basically... Um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money printing. <laughs> um, it's so much, in fact, um, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that um, it is it is really, really widespread. And I'm going to show you some charts later, but um, it is a worldwide phenomenon uh, that essentially is happening here. Now, money printing can go on, right? Um, and it did. And in fact, in 2020, um, they printed even more, essentially, uh, during the COVID crisis, right? Because the idea is that no one can work. We need to give people money to keep the system going because you need money to pay for things. Um, and uh, we had this crypto boom. And this is wild speculation, which reminds us of the uh, speculation with the Binder Boys in Miami, reminds us of the dot-com speculation, and also to the speculation uh, essentially in real estate where everyone was just buying all kinds of houses and stuff like that. Um, ultimately, though, what happens when you speculate in this kind of stuff, and I'm sure you guys remember that uh, you had Kathy Wood and the team and everyone saying, hey, everyone, Bitcoin's going to go to a million dollars. And like all these people are just pumping this stuff. Um, but ultimately, 
uh, you have game over, right? And it just comes to a point to where people realize, wow, this stuff isn't really worth anything. And one of the things, though, I've kind of discovered throughout this whole system and understanding the history of the markets and, and sort of crashes is, is I think you need three things to really get this ball rolling. One is you need to have essentially a government that's not regulating it, essentially unregulation. Um, and also, too, the, another way to think about it as well is a government that's supportive of lending. So the banks essentially need to be lending out people money, need to be le letting people you know, over leverage, um, needing to give people money so they can have credit, so they can buy cars, buy homes, buy clothes, all these things. Everything's going to revolve around shopping, and you need sort of the system in place to where the pumpers, uh, be it the binder boys, be it the dot-com boys, be it the crypto boys, the uh, mortgage boys, whatever, um, getting people to buy stuff, right? This this is our whole system, is getting people to buy stuff, uh, not regulating it, and encouraging lending. Um, one of the things, though, that happens as I'm sure you guys know, is that um, we have crazy, crazy inflation. And um, suddenly the Fed is thinking, you know what? Uh, that quantitative easing stuff, we can't necessarily do that forever. Uh, and so now we're reversing course and what's known as quantitative tightening. And so this is just exactly what it sounds. It is opposite of quantitative easing. And so um, in the past, what we're doing is we're uh, buying contracts, giving cash to banks. Now, essentially what we're doing is, is we have all of these essentially contracts, bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, we're giving them back to the banks. The banks give the Fed cash, and the, and, and the Fed can actually just basically burn the cash. The other thing they can do, too, is not sell uh, these contracts back to anyone and essentially just burn it. And, and this is sort of a way to control the money supply. And um, as a result, what happens is the interest rates are going to go up, and then the banks are not going to be so aggressive in lending because they don't have as much cash to lend. The other thing that happens, too, in this system is the Fed can decide how much money, how much cash a bank must have. Because the idea was back in the 30s, there was no real regulations. The bank could just lend it whatever they want. The bank could lend five times as much cash as they want um, and like not have any cash in the bank. Like A bank could run out of money back in, the, say, the Great Depression. Today, though, the bank's supposed to have a certain level of cash, and the banks are always fighting to like, you know, reduce that level or something of that nature. They just want to make money and want to keep lending. Um, but basically, the, our whole system is, is based on keeping the money flowing and uh, lending out money. Um, but in this current environment, though, we have too much inflation, and now the Fed is looking at doing the reverse of quantitative easing and uh, go into quantitative tightening. Um, we have never done this in history, so this could lead to a major crash. Um, no one knows, to be really frank, no one knows because we haven't done this before, so there's no other uh, uh, way to really think about this. Um, one of the things, too, I, I will say, though, is that um, we are in a bubble, uh, mostly because of all the money that we've printed, right? But the bubble can last forever. If, as long as you want to keep printing, you can do it, right? Will there be game over? Not necessarily. And this is sort of why uh, I pose this question to you, is why not necessarily? Well, one of the reasons is because our whole system, I've already mentioned it several times, but um, uh, the U.S. economy is 70% consumers. That means for us to keep doing what we do, we got to keep buying those iPhones, got to keep buying those Teslas, we got to keep buying those clothes, we got to keep the money circulating, right? And yes, uh, you can't have inflation, but if you just keep printing money, right? And if you keep the system of uh, less regulation, uh, encourage lending, uh, keep pumping, be it uh, people on, on YouTube, people on social media, uh, be it big companies pumping with advertising, getting you to buy stuff, the system just keeps on going. Um, the big problem, though, is that the U.S. is not alone, as I alluded to before. Um, this chart shows you, in fact, that you can see uh, this is all of the um, contracts, essentially, on the balance sheets of, of uh, major banks. Uh, these are central banks. So you have the Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and Bank of England. Uh, this is essentially all of the money uh, slash bonds slash mortgage-backed securities that they put on their balance sheet. Remember, when they buy these things, they give cash to the banks, and what they do is they encourage the banks to lend money, right? Keep interest rate low and encourage banks to lend money. Um, and you can see totally in the system, and this is just the four major banks, there's about $26.7 trillion in, on the balance sheets of these things. And um, if you want to control inflation, then you're going to want to reverse the system. But uh, it's a lot of money to reverse because um, uh, when I give you these numbers, you say, okay, Chris, what does that mean? Um, what is, you know, uh, $8.5 trillion on the balance sheet? Well, uh, in the U.S. situation, you can see here, it's roughly a third. So roughly a third of... of What's on the Fed's balance sheet is 
uh, makes up the third of our GDP. But you can take a look at in Europe, though, it's even worse. It's like 63 percent, UK 48, Japan 104. Uh, so we are in a, a major, major bubble. But yes, if you keep printing, I, I guess uh, that solves all problems. Because remember, the gist of it was before the original idea of printing was that the banks had these bad contracts uh, that no one could pay. And then you just printed money out of thin air. And as a direct result of that, we have inflation and the thing that we have now. So as you can see here, essentially our whole world economy is one big Jenga. And this this alludes to the uh, big short movie where they're you know saying essentially you, you start pulling out enough pieces of our financial system, it all crumbles. But if you print enough money, it could actually hold the financial system up. So yes, theoretically, you could print money forever and you could print money to the moon, but you have inflation. And uh, if inflation does spiral out of control, something's got to give. And it feels like what we're doing with our whole ec modern economic system is we're just keep passing the buck to the future and keep passing the buck to the future. And if governments overspend, or if people overspend, eh, just print more money, right? And that's sort of the world that we live in now. And so I pose this question to you in our current system. How long do you think it's going to be sustainable? Thanks again for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And I'll catch you guys next time.